Station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Station is ready. Boise State University, this is Mission Control Boise Houston. Station, Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Bo Boise State University. How do you hear me? Boise State, we have you loud and clear. Stephen Rick, good to see you. Um, welcome to Boise State University. We like to get the show rolling right away. So first Bron Space Bronco, step on up. I'm Jaime Guevara, uh, junior mechanical engineer. As experienced astronauts who have flown on several missions, are there things that you guys have to get used to again? Were there any surprises this time around? I think for me, every time I come up, I have to get used to just floating in space again. My body has to get used to floating in space again. But for surprises, not really for me. Rick, you got any? No, but it did, you do have to get used to it again every time you come up here. Hi, I'm Emery Ross. I'm a senior majoring in English. I was wondering if you could tell us about Veggie, your space garden experiment. Are there any effects on the lettuce plants you might expect? Well, that question is perfect timing. Tomorrow, actually, Steve and I will begin to install the veggie experiment. It just arrived on SpaceX, a cargo ship, uh, oh, less than two weeks ago. And uh, so tomorrow we will be installing it, and hopefully we'll be growing plants pretty soon. We do have other experiments right at Steve's feet. You can see this bright light, maybe. This is growing, uh, I think, it's a type of mustard seed here. And we have another experiment called Gravity 2 that we're also working on. I'm working on it today. So we do have other plant experiments that are ongoing. But I think the veggie one is going to be the most interesting for crew members because we're actually going to be growing the plants, not just studying how the roots move and how the roots react to different uh, G levels. We're actually going to be growing plants. And so I think it's going to be uh, I think it's going to be great for crew members psychologically, and of course we're going to learn how to how to grow plants in space, which of course we all know is very important. My name is Brett Howell. I'm a biology major and a junior here at Boise State. Steve, are all astronauts susceptible to visual impairment after a long duration in spaceflight? Can you share your experience about being the guinea pig or the test conductor for the ocular health experiment, and any predictions you have about what you might discover? That's a good question. Not all astronauts have been affected with uh, any kind of space degradation. Some are, some have been, of course. Let's see. For me, luckily, right now, I have not had any uh, eye issues at all. Uh, but I still have some time up here, and that might change. As for being a guinea pig, um, those experiments uh, are a little taxing on your eyes. Uh, I don't know if you know what a fundoscope is, but we have to do that, and that's a bright, bright light that blinks in your eye quite a bit. Uh, it kind of blinds you a little bit. Uh, we also do an OCT scan, which uh, takes a lot of concentration. As like Rick's like to say, you have to give it the evil eye for it to work, and it lasts about a half hour. But so uh, it's a lot of work, but we believe it's worthwhile because we've got to figure out what's happening to eyes up here and why do they change. Hi, I'm Sarah Wren, sophomore chemistry major. Um, Rick, would you please tell us about your favorite science experiment while on the ISS? Yeah, it's hard to pick one. Uh, you know, one of the experiments we do up here is working with the uh, Sphere satellites, and this is a lot of fun. Uh, it's both educational and uh, it's also useful for uh, developing control algorithms. But we also work with a lot of different experiments. I think the veggie experiment we talked about earlier is going to be uh, is going to be really interesting. Unfortunately, I leave in about a week, so I probably won't get to see much of the you know, the plants growing very large. Uh, I think, the, but the type of experiments that I find the most interesting are the ones where we actually are working with the uh, with the principal investigator, the PI, and we're actually talking with them on the loops directly, and they're telling us, "Okay, try this in the experiment, try that in the experiment, now do this." And those are the ones I think are the most interesting when you really feel like you're actually contributing to their scientific uh, studies and their research. Hi, I'm Dave, junior in marketing. Rick. What is the most valuable lesson you've learned from something that did not go as planned on one of your missions? Tough one. 
Yeah, it's a tough one. You know, I, I I always say, and I've been saying for many, many years, I think Steve would agree that you learn more from your mistakes than you do from your successes. You know, when you make a mistake, uh, you know, running a procedure, or if you're out doing a spacewalk and you make a mistake or you're doing something inside here, you make a mistake, you really, that lesson that you learn from that mistake is something you'll never, ever forget. Whereas if you're always successful at something, you tend to become complacent and then you, you're, you know, you could easily make a mistake on it, even though you've done it many times successfully. Uh, I can't think of any very specific events. Uh, I've made many, many mistakes up here, and I, I always tell the folks on the ground that before I launch, I said, I guarantee you that I will make mistakes. Hopefully they'll be small, and uh, and I won't make any large ones to jeopardize safety or, or the mission. And so far, I've been lucky, lucky and uh, all the mistakes have been small, but I can't think of any specific ones. Hi, I'm Jordan Smotherman, a uh, junior in IT management. Uh, Steve, um, speaking of things that don't go quite as planned, you, um, your arrival to the ISS was delayed by a couple days because a berm failed. How often do errors like that happen, and what do the teams on and above the ground do to prepare for those things? Well, that was the first time it happened since we started doing the short rendezvous, which is a six hours from launch until station. And we've only done it probably, I think, five people have done that, five different Soyuzes. But we've had a multitude of progresses. I think we're up to about six, seven, or eight progresses that have done it. So we had some data on it, and it was seemed to be going really well until my mission. Uh, but uh, we do prepare for stuff like that. Uh, we do training scenarios or sims where we have failures and that take us to the two-day rendezvous. So we practice that in the sims beforehand. The ground uh, teams practice the same thing. So it wasn't that uh, a big a deal in the sense of uh, we've seen this before. We know what we need to do when we accomplished our tasks. It just took a lot longer to get here. And uh, besides that, it was fun. Steve, this is Dad. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the temperature swing, swings you get when you're on the EVA and uh, what it does from darkness to light and how you compensate for that in the suit? Sure, it's great talking to you. Uh, um, yeah, when we're outside uh, during the EVA, the, uh, the temperature is mostly the metals that we touch, which really changes, and they go from about plus 250 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit. So what you really can tell is when you're grabbing pieces of metal, if, you, uh, if, it's, cold, if it's dark out there, it's going to be cold, and if you grab something for a long time, your hands are going to get cold. So we actually have heaters in our gloves we can turn on, and they're just uh, thermal uh, resistive heaters, and they, they keep your hands warm. And also for the suit, then if, and they, if you can get hot when the sun's out there, so we do we have a suit we have a cooling system in the suit that has water circulating through our suit and actually in a garment that we wear and so it's next to our body and we can regulate the temperature of that water to regulate the temperature of our, of our body Rick we understand that astronauts exercise a lot on the ISS how common are injuries such as ligament tears how could you properly care for them Yeah, that's a, it's a great question because I think it's very common. Uh, I know just about everybody I've been up here with, yeah, you, uh, you know, we push a lot of weight up here, even though we're in a weightless environment with the resistive device that we have. Uh, for example, when we do squats, you have, to, you have to add your body weight to your squats. So you're squatting 300, 400 pounds, something you're not used to. And this is a lot of weight on your shoulders. It's still pushing down on your shoulders as opposed to your whole body. And so uh, it's very easy to tweak your back or uh, tweak your, your legs in some way. But I haven't seen anybody get seriously hurt. But folks have tweaked something. And I, I tweaked my back, I think, uh, about a month or so when I, would, I got up here after about a month. But all I did was lighten the load. I just uh, was, was a little more careful on the resistive device, made sure I had very good form. And that's kind of the really important thing is when you're on those devices to really concentrate on what you're doing and not get sloppy. You know, anytime you're at the gym pushing heavy weights, you need to be careful on your form. Uh, the way we prepare for it is, uh, again, we train a lot with the trainers before we come up here in the gym on regular weight machines and then also on the, uh, on the space station's resistive device so that we do have good form. And if somebody does get hurt, of course, we talk to the docs, we talk to the folks on the ground, and they help us work out, work out any problems that we may have. 
Hi, Amanda, health science major. What is the risk of infectious disease on board the ISS? Are colds worse in microgravity? That's a good question, but uh, luckily we've not been sick, and I don't know of any many people who have gotten sick, but your immune system does get weakened up here. And so I think it would have a bigger effect if we happen to get sick, but we do a pretty good job of trying to keep uh, all the germs down on Earth and not bring them up with us. Uh, so luckily that's worked out well, and we haven't had people getting sick up here. Uh, so uh, that's a good question, though, because I know it's a, it's a big topic for long-duration flight. Hi, Camille Eddy, um, freshman, mechanical engineering. Steve, what does the conservation of angular momentum look like in microgravity? Can you give us a demonstration, please? I will try to give you a demonstration. There's two versions. All right, so Steve's doing you know, your standard uh, figure skater. When your hands are in, he spins faster. When his hands are out, he'll slow down a little bit. Now he's got a. Now he's doing the. Uh... Hopefully that worked for you. <laughs> I found it fun. John Gerritsen, Senior Public Relations and Communications. What are some of the safety measures on the ISS that might not be immediately intuitive to people on Earth? Yeah, you know, we have the standard things like we have fire extinguishers and we have uh, we have uh, portable oxygen masks. Uh, one of the things that we have that probably not uh, obvious to most folks is uh, uh, we have ammonia masks. Uh, the, the, the external systems are cooled uh, with ammonia, and then there's heat exchangers that that uh, transfer the heat with a uh, with a water loop on the inside. But it's a very 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 low probability that that ammonia that's outside the space station could leak inside. Highly highly unlikely, and we have uh, lots of uh, safeties. Uh, checks in place to avoid it. But if there is a leak inside, it's very, very poisonous gas. It's very deadly. So we do have these ammonia masks that we put on if there is an ammonia leak. That's probably uh, not something that you see in a, you know, a standard building or anything. Uh, but other than that, uh, the, you know, standard safety features like any uh, public building are up here. Hi, Ellen Geary, freshman in bilingual education. Have you experienced any mental or attitude shifts that might surprise someone who's never been to space? Well, I haven't, but I think they have. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Um, not that I, you know, it's tough to tell. I think, you know, you have the same ups and downs as you do out, down on Earth. I mean, there's days when you feel great, and there's days when you're just kind of tired of the job and you, you know, want to do something different. But I think that's the same any place you go. So I don't really know anything different up here that, that's been different than on Earth. I'm Skylar Rogers. I'm in sixth grade at Monroe Elementary. And I was wondering if there's anything in space that works um, exactly the same as it does on Earth. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. You know, I always say that space is the place where the impossible things are easy, like, you know, we could float, we could lift thousands and, you know, pound, uh, objects that weigh thousands of pounds on the earth, but the easy things are difficult up here. The simple things like uh, if eating your food and just putting salt on your food or going to the bathroom or brushing your teeth, all this, putting your clothes on, all the things that you learned but when you were two or three or four years old are very, very difficult up here because of the weightless environment. Uh, but the things that are the same, I don't know, and there's not much that's really the same, uh, to tell you the truth, I can't think of it off the top of my head. Neela Mohammed Musa, computer science student, um, Boise State. If you could design and build a brand new space station, how would it differ from the ISS? 
<laughs> That's a good one, yes. As Rick just pointed out, have a shower. That would help a lot. Uh, maybe even like a little toaster oven would be great, too. But uh, I think the biggest thing, though, is uh, if we need to go places farther away from Earth, like Mars, that we need a vehicle that's a little more autonomous, has a little more, I guess, robust ability and sense of that it, it doesn't break as often, it's reliable. Uh, those kind of features I think you'd have to build into it. Uh, something that also can uh, uh, have recycle everything on board. You can reuse all sorts of things. Uh, maybe like a 3D printer where you can make your own parts if you needed to. All these kind of things, that's what I would put into a new vehicle. I know that I'm right next to Steve. That's about all I know. <laughs> no, uh, well, if you, if you ask me how do we know where we are over the Earth, well, there's a couple of different ways. We could look out the windows. We have a cupola, which is basically this uh, small uh, compartment with seven windows, like a glass bottom boat, if you will, and it points down at the Earth. We could always go look out the cupola windows, and if you're, uh, if you're really good at geography, which is not easy up there, I'll tell you, looking down at the Earth on a cloudy day, it's kind of hard to tell where you are. But if you can make out some of the land masses, you could recognize them. And then the other way is we have a computer program that that uh, displays our trajectory on the world, and we call it World Map. So you can easily look at any of the computers here on the space station and tell where we are over the Earth. Hello there. I'm, my name is Ken Winkleman. I'm a senior here at Boise State, majoring in English literature and political science, and I am a McNair Scholar. Can each of you share an observation about individual personalities or cultural or national differences when it comes to living and working together on the ISS? That's a tough one. But uh, I guess I would say off the, off the, uh, the cuff here is that uh, our current commander, Kuichi Wakata, is from Japan. And I've noticed that they work long hours. That guy never stops working. And that's standard, I think, for their culture. And so it's something uh, I've noticed before we were on the ground, and he still does it up here. And it's great to have a crewmate that has that kind of uh, ability and desire to work that much. I guess uh, one of the things I recognize is uh, for our Russian crewmates, I know on the U.S. segment, or the USOS segment it's called, it's where the, uh, it's the U.S., it's Japan, Canada, European astronauts kind of live and work mostly. Uh, we communicate a lot more with the ground, I believe. You know, we have a lot of interaction with the ground folks, whereas it seems like that the Russian, our Russian colleagues over on the other side, they're a little more autonomous, if you will. They kind of do things and then report them done at the end of the day or report if they have a problem, but I think they're a little more autonomous on that side. So I think that's a cultural thing and also just the way uh, their technology is and the way their program is. Hi, Sarah again. I would like to ask, when you've looked out of the cupola, what is the most remarkable thing you've ever seen? That's another tough one. I mean, there's many beautiful and remarkable things to see when you look out the cupola. I guess so far from me, uh, I like the the, uh, the waters, the shallow waters in the Caribbean or the atolls in the south uh, east of the Pacific are just beautiful. There's this blue, this aqua that comes up against the dark blue of the other part of the ocean and the islands is just uh, magnificent. It's just so beautiful for me. Hey, this is Dave from Marketing again. What is the most challenging thing about wearing a spacesuit, and what improvements would you like to see in future spacesuits? Hey, Dave. Uh Excuse me. The most challenging thing about the spacesuit is it takes a long time to actually uh, get our body get uh, our body ready to go down to vacuum or go out into the vacuum of space because of uh, the protection that we need from the bends. You know, we have to do a lot of pre-breathing of oxygen, kind of like a diver doing some deep water diving. We have to pre-breathe pure oxygen, try to get the nitrogen out of our body. And if we had a suit that we could run at a higher pressure, the suit runs at about 4.2 psi or so delta pressure. If we had a suit that ran at a higher pressure, we wouldn't have take wouldn't need to take as much time to prepare and get getting into the suit.
suit and pre-breathing, and we can go out the door and do a spacewalk a lot easier and a lot less overhead. But given that, though, when with those high pressures, it makes the suit harder to move. You know, you're, you, all that pressure, you have to squeeze your hand against that pressure, and it makes it more difficult to move. So we need to look at suits where we could have increased pressure, uh, decreasing the amount of time it takes to prepare to go outside and do a spacewalk, but then also allows the crew member uh, to move, move easily in the suit and not get injured. You know, some of the spacesuits we have up here are pretty tough on the body and can cause injury over long periods of time, so we got to take that into account also. Hi, it's Emery again. First of all, I wanted to say thank you both so much for this. And my question is for Steve, what has changed on the ISS since your previous mission that makes living and working on the station better? Uh, you're welcome. First and second, I think the biggest thing, of course, is the cupola we've been talking about. That wasn't here on my last two missions, and so it's great to have that. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful view of the Earth. You can spend hours and hours just looking down and enjoying the beautiful planet. Besides that, there's a couple more modules that help uh, size-wise, and really that's for storage mostly, and that really helps, too, to keep uh, things a little more organized up here. Right again, guess we have time for one more question. Rick, in the research that you are doing, what materials have you found that burn more efficiently in microgravity, and what implications does this have for future space tech development? Oh, so you saved the hardest question for last, okay. <laughs> well, we are doing an experiment, it's called BASS, uh, Burning and Suppression in Space, I believe that stands for, and there's a glove box right off to our, our left over here, and we are burning different materials. Uh, I'll be honest with you, though, I'm kind of like the operator of the experiment. I'm not inti uh, intimately involved and, and knowledgeable about all the different materials, but we have, I, I have seen, like we tried to burn Nomex one time, and that it had a hard time getting that to burn. Of course, we vary the oxygen and nitrogen in the box to to see how things burn in different environments. Uh, but we did have some of these plastic materials that uh, gave us a pretty big ball of flame up here. Uh, I don't know the uh, specific names of them all, but it is kind of neat to be able to actually burn things in space. It's, uh, it's Obviously, it's very safe because we have all different levels of protection here, but it's, uh, it's kind of interesting to watch the different materials burn. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. And thank you, Boise State University Station Houston. We're back to operational audio communications.